Welcome to the Momentum Lifestyle Podcast, where every Monday we interview an inspiring, educational, and entertaining guest to help you build confidence, find balance, and live a life of impact. We'd like to thank our sponsor today, Be Spunky. Now, Blake, Janoa, and myself have been using their Reboot product for well over six months now, and it has been life-changing. I found myself recovering faster, having way more energy throughout the day, and honestly feeling just more jacked up as a man. And this is because Reboot is clinically formulated to support healthy male hormone levels, providing stress relief, improved strength and stamina, enhanced drive, and overall well-being. Bee Spunky Reboot contains a proprietary blend of 10 natural and organic herbs and active ingredients that are renowned for helping men to enhance physical and cognitive performance, improve stamina, energy, and endurance, optimize testosterone levels, support healthy reproductive function, support cardiovascular function, relieve stress, mild anxiety, irritability, relieve tiredness, fatigue, support healthy sleep patterns, and support healthy body weight. So as you can see, it is a must-have product for all men. So head to their website, bespunky.com.au. That's B-E-S-P-U-N-K-I.com.au and use the code MOMENTUM to receive 10% off all Be Spunky products. Please welcome to 2022. Dylan, it's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Dylan. How much, the invite. how much did you, your days changed from December 31st to January 1st? You know, is it a complete, is it a new year, new me kind of vibe? That's what I've been thinking about for the last two weeks, you know, the whole new year, new me. And look, that's all it takes really to change. Just the flip, and, flip of the, yep. the date. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you look different as well. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> is, it the new, is it the new skincare routine? What's what is it? Blake twenty. What do we get? Nivea, Garnier. What do we got? I'm using something. Shani's got me on something called Drunken Elephant. I don't know much about it, but apparently it's good and it feels nice on my skin. Skin. So now that's literally. Is that something that you've taken like a real priority now that you're 49? You just like really want to look after your skin or. Well, look at me. For a forty-nine-year-old, I'm looking, you know, pretty, pretty good. good. So, um, a little bit of just for men through there, just to get rid of the greys. A little bit of drunken elephant on the face, and I look like I'm in my mid thirties again, which is a good feeling. That is mm. a good feeling, mate. Thirties, late thirties. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw for the first time ever you with scruff on your Instagram last week. You had genuine scruff. I didn't even know you could get scruffy. Oh, you mean well. The- yeah, he had the he had the grey beard. Oh, and yeah. off the white beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is there's two problems. The first problem is, as you can see, when it grows out, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of grey. Yeah. The second problem is I've actually got the ginger gene, so it gets to a certain point. It gets to about ten days, and overnight, it turns to like flaming ginge. So I'd love to grow out a bit. I thought, you know, how much more masculine I'd look with a beard. Those are my only two problems. So if I want to put a bit of colour through it, maybe I'll grow it out. I actually don't mind you with a bit of growth. If you could just get clippers to keep it a certain level before the, you know. Yeah, it's about the 10 day and then it just overnight turns flaming. Yeah. Didn't, didn't you do something similar? To step out to help help you with your ego, didn't you do what was that? That was you, right? What did you do? The haircut. Yeah. I did the Dusty Martin, and then I grew the mustache. That's right. That's right. <laughs> maybe you do. Maybe this is the next step: is just to let your facial salad grow out a bit, yeah. see what comes up for you. Really, really lean into it. it. Do you know what? I know we're going to be pretty vulnerable today, so I'll just start. I'll start it here right now. Is there's there's probably a little bit for me to overcome in that and one of the reasons is there's a pretty healthy age gap between shani and i so i do get a little bit of like a little bit of that in it where i'm like yeah people like is that uncle or dad or are they dating i get it like it's kind of well it depends you know depending where we're going if she calls me daddy you know it depends it depends what day it is so we just roll with whatever 
that would not go over well if you go out to date night or something and they're like, oh, and, and what would your father like? Uh, that's, so that, that's actually my if, boyfriend. If that was the case, I'd leave dinner, I'd go home, have a shave, get like my hair cut really short and that, that knocks about five years off. Mate, I will, I will never forget I, when I was working at a cafe, this gorgeous girl would come in all the time. She was a regular and she was dating an ex football player who was a bit older than her and my boss i was talking to her my boss comes up and she's like oh like you two have a lot in common and we were both like what do we have in common and he goes oh well, yes your dads you, you both your dads are in are in football and she has turned to him and be like he, he's my boyfriend and I was like, how do I get out of this? I was at work. I was like, how do I get out of this conversation? Where, where do I jump out of the window? It was so embarrassing. I and love she, that. She, she was like, I'm going to wait for my coffee outside and stepped outside and waited. I was like, <laughs> it's not good. Not good, mate. Uh, yeah. uh, so, <clears throat> Jay, 2022, mm. what is on the, what, what's on the horizon for you, mate? What's, what's coming up? I try to... I know we're all sort of similar, obviously, is work on little mini theme for a, for a block. And that was when we, you know, we were chatting the other day around one of my lessons was the potency, which I've only learned, you know, the last sort of 12 months. And it's, it's really helped having, you know, you boys to you know, call each other out and call me out and say, hey, what are you fucking focusing on? And like nail that bit before trying to do too many things. And so the, the theme for me, uh, for the first few months is to continue on and really unravel and, and uh, take my wealth and, and business growth to the next level. So, you know, up until, well, you know, most of my life I felt there's always been a, a, a block. Like I was never, I, I could, you know, Blake, you and I are quite different. So um, Blake can call in um, money easier but he also loses it just as, just as quick. Well, I struggle to, I don't call it in as easy, but I can hold on to it. I'm not better with, with it when I, when I've got it. So it's kind of funny. We sort of like these opposite scales. Like if we could just come together and like blend our combined skills and have yeah. the ideal um, wealth bl blueprint. Uh, and so I'd, I'd always felt that there'd been this weird block for me. Like I'd get, I'd get a level and I couldn't, to break past it like i've always mm. i've always got through and been fine and things have always happened for me but i was like fuck i'm not i'm not i want to go next level like i'm not here to play small and so this uh, there's already been some like obviously i've spent a lot of, done a bit of work last year and, and for me it's really now to hone in and focus of so the next like two to three months you know, i'm going to try to always maintain some kind of a book you know podcasts and some journaling even at the end of my meditations there's in, intention and attention being placed on that area of, of of my life so for me that's that's a a, a big theme which is also exci exciting because um i've already started to feel some things change and yeah. it's a different feeling what's uh, been the biggest money story for you jay so a lot of it i mean as we know a lot of these stories come from uh um you know our parents and, and growing up and so i was i didn't grow up but we never grew up poor but we were never like wealthy and so there was always a I remember always hearing a mentality around like it's a bit of a victim mentality you know like and the way that um the, the view, our view for example of like rich people wasn't that positive so like of course they can afford this because blah blah I mean my, you know mum would say something like that so that was a story that I that I've taken on so there was a bit of a, a victim like poor us, poor me, this is how we are kind of story going on. And then of course, subconsciously, I play things out to, to maintain and, and reinforce that as a belief. And then also if I, you know, I didn't look at rich people. I look at rich people like, oh, they're rich pricks, you know, whatever, you know, that even I remember I heard myself in a conversation long ago, I was like, oh, he, you know, he's rich fuckers or something. There's a comment I made and I was like, there's a, of course, I don't want to allow myself to get to that level, if that's my default view, without even realizing of sort of the the, the uber wealthy, and so there were there were a couple of the biggest stories that that came up for me. That I was like, ah, oh, fuck, no wonder I've been um, blocking myself uh, from from going to the next level, which is 
it's cool when you even just get that awareness because you can hear the language like you you know the first response when someone says something to you I now can pick up like ah my response was to go yeah of course or blah blah um and now when I can pick up on that and I can then shift the narrative go, no 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 this is where we're going now or even shift the, the verbal response and that starts shifting the energetics of you know what I'm putting out into the world and how I'm feeling and, and responding um so that's been really really cool to pick up on and then start realizing how it's playing out. Cause most of what we're saying, as you know, it's just this, we don't even realize what we're saying or how we're responding. And, and um, that's been a really cool process that I really want to like ram home this next few months. What, what comes to that for you, Jay, when you think about, you know, doubling your income and we don't need to talk specific numbers, but what, what, what changes for you? And, the reason I want to emphasize this is two parts. One, because a lot of people are really fixated on more income, thinking if you know I get to A and B, then and and this mentality that most of society has in terms of the happiness. But what changes for you, I guess, on a um, material and physical level, and what do you expect to change potentially more on you know a mindset, energetic? emotional level mm. so a big part of i think i know where you're leading me here is is uh looking at well okay so yeah i want more money and i want to hit you know i want to double my business and blah blah and go what's that actually going to give me how am i going to feel so a big part of me and one of my biggest values also is around freedom and so i've been really looking into okay what does it feel like for me like in my body, what does it actually feel like when I am totally free and not worrying about, okay, so I've got two or three months of money to live. Like what happens then? And when I step out of that into the next level up, so I'm really tapping into how does it feel? And it's a totally different feeling in my body. Like I can actually, I, I go into like, okay, so how do I feel when I'm worrying about, you know, where's the income coming from the next three months versus how does it feel in my body when I just know I've got bank and it doesn't matter anymore and it's just such a lighter it like it, it feels exciting so I'm like it's like it's exciting it's free it's expansive it's like oh you know i'm not worrying about let's go over here like i'm not questioning or should i go out for this dinner should i not going to be careful you know that kind of stuff that all that all goes and so the big thing for me is that it's just this light like free feeling and another another big part of for me also is around uh <clears throat> this like i really like i froth the ability to do things for other people and be like, yeah, I'm going to get this dinner here or yeah, I want to like, you know, I'd love to be able to go off oh, my family. Like, I want to fly up here for, to, to buy for the weekend. And so this is ability to just also be um, generous. And the, so the kicker here is that I don't have to wait until I get more money to start tapping into these feelings and, and being generous. It doesn't have to, I have to fly my family up for like in a weekend in, in Byron. I can, you know, be the person who shouts an extra coffee or be more generous with my time. You know, I can still live a life of freedom, which we kind of are now. And so what I'm learning and trying to embody is, okay, so who is the me and how does that change when I've got all this money and how can I step into that now energetically so I'm actually ready to, to call that in? Because I for so long, I was always like waiting for, oh, when I finally make this, you know, level of, of bank and then I can finally be the person I want to be. And that was a mistake I was making for so long. So I was like, okay, so who do I, you know, allow myself to become and, and step into? And so now it's like, okay, I'm trying to step into that now, which is uh, a different different process and a fun one because you can like, it's like, oh, this is what it feels like. Um, and catch yourself when you go back to the old the old feeling again and, and, and flip yourself back around. Um, yes, that's a cool little process as well. Uh, uh, B... Do have instead of have do be um, mentality, which we talk quite a lot about in our momentum mentorship and in the mastermind too. It's like rather than focusing on okay, I want to have more money. What do I need to do to have more money, and then I will become rich? It's like okay, I need to become rich first, and then the processes, and then the having follow for, on from that. And it's a cool shift in mindset. Do you have any tips or tricks? in any realm not necessarily just in the wealth but for you how did you go about changing the mentality away from that have do be into the be do have model 
Mm, so <clears throat> my first thing was to look at it and go, okay, cool. If I were to have X, Y, Z in the bank, what would I want to spend it on? What would I want to have? Then so to be like, okay, cool. I'd, you know, want to do this for my family and I'd want to, you know, buy this car and do these things. And I was like, okay, cool. So those, those, those things are, you know, drivers and they were mainly extrinsic uh, drivers. And I tap into, okay, so what is it actually going to give me? Like, what is it about the car that I, um, that I want? And it's like, that's like achievement and fun and, you know, and a little bit of significance. And then, you know, what is, you know, what is it, what does it be around <laughs> the G wagon, you know, and, and, um, and what, so, and what is um, hitting a certain level and be able to um, fly my family over to be able to, you know, do what I want going to give me. And it's like, you know, connection. And, and for me also, that was a level of being able to like uh, treat and be generous and all, all these kind of things. So what I did was I was tap into first, like hey, what are the what are the first you know group of things that I would uh, and I'd reinvest a lot back into my business as well. So for me, that investment component is really really important, and that's around like growth and expansion. So what I tapped into there was it's not about the things as such; it's the intrinsic drivers behind those things that I'm really they're the juicy things that I'm driven by, and I don't need to necessarily have the car to experience that or I don't need to necessarily, you know, fly the family up for a fancy weekend in, in, in Byron to experience with other things. So it's like, then you go into what do those things feel like? So what is it, what is it? I've literally visualized in my head, the experience of like telling my family, like, Hey, guess what guys? Um, I'm doing this for you guys for two weeks. Let's take two weeks off and everything's covered. And I've tapped into that feeling and the story and how they look back at me and the excitement on their faces and how that feels in my body. And I'm like, ah, and get used to that, that feeling first. And then even, okay, like, so now that, that I can't do that, what are other ways that I can try to, you know, create a similar experience with them free to this happening so I get used to that feeling. So that's kind of what I did. So I looked into, okay, what are the things that I want? And, but what's the real driver behind those things? Then tap into um, those experiences as first. I think that's worth expo exploring. And we talk about it a lot um, in terms of on a deeper level, what is it that you're actually seeking? And obviously we've spent a lot of time doing work around this. But you've still got a society under the illusion that when I get to this position in corporate, when I find this person, when I buy this G-Wagon, then my problems will be fixed. And that's the hedonic treadmill that most people stay on. If they get there, you know, they can post it on social media, whatever it might be, and they get a little kind of buzz for 24, 48 hours. And then you know, for the majority of people, it's somewhat of a letdown. And then they raise the bar because that, level isn't good enough anymore and they raise the bar and they just stay on this what's called hedonic treadmill so it's a really good exercise for a lot of people to explore on a deeper level to break down what janelle said what is it that you're actually seeking is it status which again you know if you look at um, aristotle's four levels of happiness isn't really going to hit the sweet spot anyway you know i think there's a universal uh um, threshold of a and obviously it's different depending where you're at if you live in the middle of you know sydney very different number but a universal number of eighty seven and a half thousand dollars in which your happiness doesn't improve after and that's kind of part of the reason i asked you jay that question is because i know that you're not attached to like oh my god all my problems are going to dissolve when i get to status a or i can buy you know whatever it might be so um, that's really valuable for those who can step away from it. And that's strong conditioning. That's really hard to step away from thinking it's going to solve your problems to be able to see on a deeper level um, where that comes from. What's, what's been the focus over the last three months um, for you on a, you know, whether it's a theme goal or intention point of view, obviously the three of us are always kind of plugging away and, and, you know, looking to improve and better ourselves and, probably for, the, for the, the three of us, the last three months have been um, as gnarly as any three months, you know, as a collective where we're all being balls deep at the same time. So what's that process been for you and what um, therapies, modalities, processes have you explored over the last three months that have helped you? Right, last three months has been solid. <clears throat> so 
the, the catalyst for me uh, to step into the, the work that I did in the last three months was it came from the relationship and intimacy piece. And it felt like there was a, a struggle to really open myself up to give and receive love and intimacy at, at, intimacy at a deeper level. I thought I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. But then there were some experiences where I felt like there was a block and I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. And so the catalyst there was to look into, you know, is there any um, wounding that is, you know, blocking me from fully opening up, you know, particularly in that the feminine component of like receiving, you know, that, that ties into receiving anything, receiving love, receiving wealth, they're all, they're all, you know, tied in. And so that led me to uh, do some uh, deep work on the masculine and feminine for, for both, <clears throat> um, which, which tends to come from, you know, when you're younger, the, the masculine representation and the feminine representation. So for most people, it's mum and dad or uncle or whoever was that um, person or those people in, in your life. And so I did uh, a lot of work energetic work you know with um the kinesiologists and we did collapses so basically we went through the whole all the the blocks and the things that are manifesting into my life at the moment that that come from feminine wounds so things around you know me not being able to receive and <clears throat> fully open up to to love and 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 step into sort of flow and that was a lot of the feminine stuff that that came up so it was a big work around like collapsing that and when when that collapsed i had six of the toughest weeks of my life like everything stopped like you know dating a few girls they just fell to pieces and it was a big ego hit for me because it was just like not chosen and i was like the fuck's going on like and then financially uh you uh my, my like my business stopped for like six weeks that's never happened in my life as in it didn't i just didn't earn for six weeks i was like what is going on like and it was just a shake-up and what, what this work did for me was it brought up all the stuff that I was um, experiencing, but also scared of, which is like there and you've got to work through an experience and then it kind of falls away. And then the masculine was a lot more of a, a solid, I felt a lot more solid in working with that. And then while I was doing the work on the, the masculine and I also did ayahuasca ceremony. And so that was actually perfect timing because I did the ayahuasca, which was both, I sat with grandmother on the evening and then grandfather during the day. So it was the mask and the femme as, as well. And that for me was like this perfect experience at the end of doing this deep energetic work to then tap into a different level. And for me, it was a really, really solid experience. So I didn't do much purging as in terms of vomiting. Um, and there were some really strong themes for me because I just finished the masculine collapse at that time. And it was a really strong theme around me stepping heavier into this like warrior and, and, and discipline. And that ties a bit into the <clears throat> stuff we've discussed around like that presence and power um, piece for me as well. So it was a really cool, the catalyst for me, it was like this relationship stuff that I didn't feel like I was as open as I thought I was. And that was the catalyst that brought me into it. And then it was just like, because as you know, like you get a little, little, the carrot gets dangled. And then, you know, Blake, you've got about 12 months worth of your stuff, which has come from one, one, one idea, right? And all the levels start unraveling. You're like, oh, fuck, didn't see that there. And this is coming up here. And then oh, this is fun. Um, so it's been like, it was a heavy, heavy few months. But um, I'm now starting to see the, the things start to unravel and, and, and shift a little bit off the back of that, that work. So it's been cool. Funny, I feel like once you start, like you have this idea before and i don't like using this phrase because so many people use it in such a wankery way but doing the work like before you're in the space you have this idea of cool i just need to fix this one problem with myself i just need to fix this one thing and i'll be good and then you fix that and then it's like oh there's three other things i need to work on now and then you work on those three things it's like oh now i've got nine things that i need to work on <laughs> and the work just never stops like once it's a Pandora's box. Once you start, it just it just keeps coming, 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 coming. Like even I catch myself sometimes going, "Fuck, surely Blake's got to be close to finishing up the stuff he's working on." <laughs> like surely, <laughs> nah, just next one, next one, next one, next one, next book, next podcast, next 
ayahuasca ceremony, next coaching session. It's just funny how the work never stops. But also with never. that, there's one thing to also be wary of with that is to not give yourself time to properly integrate what you've just done. So, I mean, as you know, the three of us are always challenging each other, always like, what's, you know, what's your theme for the quarter and what are you doing to work on it? As opposed to, oh, I just want to, I want to work on this. Okay, so what's the action? Like, it's, I love that we keep each other accountable for that, but also is to then, you know, not finish one thing and then a week later, go for the next. Like, give yourself a bit of time to see it shift and, and change and integrate and, and it, and, embody that new experience because often you get too caught up in like yeah there's always going to be and this is the thing like we're not a problem that's going to be fixed we're a constant pro we're going to constantly evolve and evolve and it's at different paces and we're not about it's not about me being behind blake or ahead of you it doesn't fucking matter and it's that evolution process but also be okay with i'm just going to sit with this for a month or two and just let this integrate and you know get my head around it and then pull back and go cool what's what's next because the other thing on that as well is when it um, and Jay, you've obviously know about my regular nightmares at the moment, which we'll talk about <laughs> there, is when you bring it to the forefront of your mind, the process has started. Do you know what I mean? So let's say that you've, you know, for a lot of people, they've got a theme or intention this year. When it's a conscious um, thought without even doing the work, because you're, you're moving from that autopilot into a more conscious choice, the work has started. So um, we'll go into deals next and what he's been working on and, and his theme for the year. But just quickly, like a theme for me, when I made it more conscious over the last, <laughs> last month, I went from probably having one nightmare a month around this scene. And I call it nightmare. It's a little bit of kind of piss take as well. But one nightmare a, a, a month, maybe, to one to two of them a week at the moment. I'm about to start my next um, journey. Um, in which I'll kind of unpack that. But because it's come to the forefront of my mind, it's fucking showing up all the time as well. So be mindful that even in awareness, you start in the process. And just for those playing at home, this basically involves, I can hear this whimpering and sort of moaning. To <laughs> so I'll run in there and it's okay and stroke his head for a little while and do this little thing on his forehead where I do this. And then he, he calms down and he goes back to sleep again. So I go back to sleep. It's happening two or three times a week. Yeah, it's good. And I mean, that dummy that I've been sucking on most <laughs> nights has really been chewed through as well. So I'm due for another one of those. Yeah, just seeing Puff the Magic Dragon to you when you go to sleep. Is you... <laughs> you go get his bottle and just warm the milk up. Just, just <laughs> take it to him. And, yeah, it's okay. Well, you, it's well, well, look, while we're here, B-dubs, let's talk us through it. What are you nightmaring about? Obviously, yeah. you've got a pretty clear theme that you're working on and it's a, there's a few levels there, huh? Oh mate, there's there's a lot there's a lot of levels for me. Um, there's there's obviously a business theme uh, for the next twelve months, and that's kind of around doubling my income. Which again, for me, money doesn't mean much, but it's really interesting the process and who you become and what you overcome in order to get there. But the theme is very much around um, connection, and it's you know to some of those as an outsider, it might sound strange because we're literally um, surrounded by connection, and we're you know, in a very fortunate position with the businesses that we run and the world that we've created in Byron, that there's a lot of connection. And at times for an introvert, more than I can handle. But there's also this other kind of, I guess, darker side, which I haven't really spoken about um, too much in that most of my life, I've felt somewhat different to the majority. And um, now I can see the positive of it, but I've still got some healing to do in the uh, little Blake that, that isn't at peace with that. And what that looks like is that for, you know, I guess my schooling and my upbringing, my home was very um, dysfunctional to say the least. And that was something that I found really, I, I just didn't have the tools as a young kid to one, be able to deal with it, but two, to be able to communicate it because you know, most of the people that I was surrounded were, you know, came from a, a good um, home where, you know, their parents were still together and, you know, it was somewhat functioning, albeit every household's got their challenges. And then, you know, teachers just saw me as um, this very disruptive kind of pest as opposed to going, well, he's this way for a reason. What's that? So I always felt that. And then through my 20s, as you know, you know, I was very kind of, 
Shrady 180 would make a lot of judgments around, you know, people that did drugs and drinking. And I was very focused on, on, um, you know, my path and the main narrative has never felt right to me. And um, I used to kind of beat myself up about it. And now I'm obviously starting to see, you know, see and reap the benefits of not being pulled into the main narrative. The reason I'm saying this is because that has always been my story of like, I've always felt ostracized, you know, I've always felt like I'm on a different page to a lot of people. And it wasn't until a few years ago, you know, I was seeing you boys know I was seeing someone for, you know, four or five months where um, she really gave me the permission and power that I should have given myself to kind of step into that. You know, and obviously over the last couple of years, I've been very transparent in my slightly alternative approach to life. And I've been able to own it, but I haven't made peace with it. And that's that's really different. Like I've been able to step into, you know, doing things differently, but I haven't been able to make peace with the fact that I've gone about things differently. So this connection piece is multi-layered in that there's some healing for me to do around you know, the fact that I've gone about things differently, the fact that I've felt at times pretty lonely, the fact that I felt, you know, at times pretty ostracized. And the last 18 months has really brought that to light in that I find myself um, in the minority again, in terms of my choices, beliefs. And this has just brought it all to a head in terms of dealing with it. And in terms of the nightmares um, that Genoa comes in and um, soothes me and helps me get back to sleep, it's very much been around this reoccurring nightmare, not a spe- not one specific one, but very much similar stories in that, you know, um, me being outed by a group of people or me being, um, you know, um, found you know, out. Yeah. What's that, dude? Like found out? Like as in... No, nah, it's not out. found out. It's more just outed of like, sorry, dude, like we can't be mates with you right. anymore or... Um, you know, on a on a number of like they're all they're literally all different scenarios of like um, you know me me randomly walking into a pub and everyone's there and I didn't get the invite or me you know jumping on social media and seeing that you know a whole bunch of mates have gone overseas and wondering where my so like literally that there, there hasn't been there's never been two of the same story and this is like on a weekly basis um, sometimes two to three times a week and. You know, as I said, it was probably a recurring theme once a month that I never really paid much attention to. And now it's obviously really kind of strong in my psyche. So that's the start of the connection bit in terms of um, belonging. But, you know, as you boys know, with connection, you boys have brought it to my attention. There's room for a bit more vulnerability. You know, there's there's some safety and trust bit. You know, at the back end of last year, I did a masculine collapse, um, which really brought up plenty as, as well around the masculine which is ironic in the, the men's space that we are but I, i've got no doubt that that will strengthen um our business you know now that i've worked through it as well so there's a real deep um piece around connection which is so multi-layered that it, it could take the whole year which um as we know is often the case who who are you away from the outside the norm like you know what I mean? Like as, as you start to deconstruct that area of your life and you're also having these nightmares around not being included in activities or, or not feeling a sense of belonging in, in, in your tribe, who are you away from the self-proclaimed, not that you use this term anymore, but you used to use the maverick term a bit of like, yeah, like I've never felt a part of the norm. Like, who are you away from not feeling a part of the norm? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I, th- I mean, I might get you to ask it differently in a sec, but I think the thing with it is, um, on what, like, on one hand, I love the thought that I have broken away from the norm and I, and there's a level of freedom in the way that I express myself. Like, I don't give a fuck what you think about my interest in psychedelic sexuality like i'll openly kind of talk about that and at the same time there's still a chip on my shoulder and a bit of dark energy in that i haven't found peace you know those those guys who 
um, uh, you know, like do things really differently, but there's just this like ease of which they do it. There's still a little bit of like fuck you energy in yeah. in that from me, and that's that's the piece for me. You know, we've got a couple of friends here in in Byron who absolutely do things differently but you can tell there's there's an ease and there's a piece in that like oh yeah like some people will like it some won't and it doesn't need it doesn't need to be loud or it doesn't need to be brash or anything like that it's just this this ease and peace in which they do it and i think that's the piece for me now um and i guess in terms of like the belonging safety and trust which actually tie in really really closely together is i don't know if i've ever like this is on a deep, deep level. I don't know if I've ever really had a strong sense of either of those. And I remember I did a um, NLP session with Heidi, which you guys know, and it was around safety. And for those who, who haven't explored um, NLP, it's, it's obviously brilliant and I've got a background in it. And she, she wanted me to go back to a, a place and a time where I felt safe. And she's a wizard absolute wizard as, as Dylan you know I couldn't access in my mind so we're doing timeline therapy I couldn't access in my mind a time where I felt safe and that's that's not actually the case like clearly I'm very safe but that's you know we're, we're talking about kind of my my home environment and my childhood and I just couldn't like doing this timeline therapy I couldn't see I didn't have a clear picture of a moment or a time where I felt safe. And when that was the case, because every other therapy, every other modality that she's used with me, I've been able to access it, clear it, and we can move forward and I've been able to overcome it. This is the first and only time and I've been working with her for seven years now. This is the only time I couldn't access that. So that was alarm bells for me um, when I couldn't access a moment that there's like on a very deep level, there's a safety belonging and trust piece that um, needs peace. So in terms of like, all right, so you've, there's a level of awareness, this is just for, I guess for people listening, okay, so there's a level of awareness around what's going on. And always, there's always a level of like action and integration off the back of it. So what does that look like for you as in a day to day? So yes, at an energetic level, there's some stuff being shifted and, and there's an awareness there for you. So like, do you have like a challenge that you've got to do each week or, you know, what are you doing for yourself to step into that um, at an, on an, at an action based level? Well, every, so those that um, know me probably would have seen at some stage on social media that I, I meditate and I journal every morning and Every morning I start, you know, what are we, 10, 11, 12, 12 days into the new year, I start with obviously financing. So that's a big one for me this year. And then um, connection and low key was my third um, theme as well. So when I'm looking at connection, I'm literally analysing you know, not on this, not necessarily on a very rigid level, but I'm analysing my connections from the day before. So say, for example, I get a message from someone and I find myself frustrated by it because I want to focus on work. Like, what's that about? Which you guys know this is how I operate. What's that about? Like, that person's just trying to connect with me and I'm going like, fuck, leave me alone. I just want to work. Do you know what I mean? So I'm really looking at everything on a thoughts, feelings and behaviours point of view. And then through that, I can, you know, go to Pixie. Um, who's my kinesiologist and go, you know, this is coming up for me and we start unpacking it. Um, and, you know, I'm blocking, I'm blocking connection on a number of levels um, and deeper connection, obviously, you know, from an intimacy point of view, no doubt we're all blocking um, deeper connection with our kind of intimate partners as well. So that's what it looks like on a daily basis of just being super mindful of my connections of like, where am I blocking deeper connection? Where's the story coming up? Where am I avoiding opportunities to connect deeper with people? Um, and you can imagine, you know, anyone who's kind of interested in having a theme for the year, you can imagine if that that's at the forefront of your mind every single day, the one theme, how fucking deep you can go on that over the course of, a year i mean we 
the way we work now is, you know, the three of us, we tend to kind of work in quarters. That's how our businesses and our lives are set up. So that's my theme for the first quarter, but I envision it going a lot longer. And then, you know, at this stage, I've got sessions booked in fortnightly with picks to unpack all these different layers um, yeah. of connection. It's funny, as you're saying that, do you feel... Do you feel like the fuck you, the dark energy that you're working through now and as that starts to dissipate and as you start to work through it, this works as the armour to deeper vulnerability. And so as you dissolve the armour, you're getting these nightmares of like, oh, fuck, okay, I need to be more vulnerable. And without this armour, what if people don't accept me? What if as I open up and I lose this fuck you energy that's protected me for... 40, 50 years, however old you are, right? <laughs> what if what if that armor goes and you're like, oh shit, here I am. And oh, now I have to be vulnerable, you know, like shit. That's, and do you feel that's playing out? Is that landing well, it at all? I mean, fuck, it's, there's so many layers to it. But one of the things that's really jumped out at me over the last six months is I've, for the first time in my life, I've noticed that I've got some chips on my shoulder and a bit of dark energy. And um, two, two stories that really stand out to me, and I don't know if this resonates with you boys because I think you've got as much dark energy as me, is David Goggins and Michael Jordan. And the reason I say that is if, if you look at the motivation behind those two guys, that's a lot of fucking dark energy. And I resonate a lot with it. I re you know, obviously completely different worlds and completely different stories. But when I'm listening to David Goggins tell his story, I'm like, dude, I resonate. Like he's got, he's got as much fuck you energy as, as anyone I've ever heard. And, and, you know, you listen to Michael Jordan, similar story. And I remember, you know, one of Jordan's stories in, in last dance and deals, I'm sure you can kind of articulate it better than me. There's someone like Reggie Miller or something. He reckons Reggie Miller said something. Reggie Miller never said anything. And then he goes, fuck you, you dog. And goes and on. and that personally. Goes, yeah, <laughs> I took that personally. And I goes, took that personally. <laughs> scores 50 points or something in the next game. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm like, as you boys know, I'm a super motivated person. I'm hoping, and it kind of scares me a little bit. I'm hoping that that motivation is still there when it's not driven from a, a darker place, which um, I'm actually quite fearful as, as I work through my dark energy, that the motivation and drive that I still have comes from a place, obviously someone who's more at peace and the, the, the same level of motivation and drive there. It's funny, as you're saying that, I picture the X-Men scene I don't, I don't know if you're about you're nodding your head Jay. i don't know if you were about to say this as well but the x-men scene um when professor x and magneto are friends it's one of the one of the movies and he's he's magneto's whole power is resides in anger and and like hatred and professor x helps him find calm and peace and he becomes a lot more stronger as a result because his power comes from calm and peace so magneto Magneto, you go what go step into that archetype. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna get that tattoo this afternoon just to really step into it. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Right there around, no wonder even that at a level you'd wanna you block you'd wanna block yourself from losing the fuck you because I know how motivated you are and how much you like um, being determined and getting shit done. The fear of like, <laughs> if I lose the fuck you. What if I just become this like, yeah, whatever, man, it's cruise through life. Like I could, I could, knowing you, I could see the fear around that and be like, well, I might just hang on to a bit of this, fuck you, because I don't want to be like that. Um, so that'll be, power, that'll be fucking empowering when you actually can let that go and still be driven as fuck. 100%. Well, I've, I mean, we haven't spoken about this, but some of the work I did last year was around smarts and superior. You know, so uh, again, you know, I failed year eight, had to repeat it. And at school, I wasn't the smartest of, pe of, of people. And I think on a deep level, that has driven a big part of my desire to keep learning and keep growing. And, and you know, I feel like these days I'm pretty, pretty savvy when it comes to kind of human behavior and human performance. But I had to, I didn't have to, I chose and, and stepped into working with Pixie around like, the fuck you energy that came with that, you know, in terms of 
you know, people giving me shit because I wasn't the smartest of kids at school. And then that hasn't changed a thing. It was just a story of like, okay, you know, I had the fuck you energy of like, oh, you think I'm dumb? Okay, you know, here we go. And I kind of had the that energy come. And that's been able to fall away over the last four or five months. And as a result, you know, how I'm showing up on social media is a little better, bit better as well in terms of not being as condescending, which all came from a place of inferior. Um, and my motivation, as you guys see and, day, and Jay, you see on a daily basis, hasn't changed in terms of my interest and in delivery in learning and growing and researching and everything as well. So there's a little bit of evidence there for me, which is really important to see, okay, you've been able to get rid of one of the chips on your shoulder and you're still as driven and motivated in that area. Cool. That helps us kind of step into and explore this new space as well. Do you reckon that the, um, I was listening to the, the, the tie on from this, how the structure that you've had to put in place to train for the Ironman, has that, do you reckon, played out into helping you be like operate the same way and the same level of structure, determination, motivation for business? Because, you know, the, the, you had to get up in the morning and ride your bike and it was fucking raining and then, you know, you'd be exhausted and go train again and sit out the back and ride on the, the veranda and then do this, go out to Aston Mill and swim in this fucking shitty pool and it just happened, all right? And you, you had to show up and, and keep doing it. And so, and you're working towards what you then end up knowing there was going to be no glory. There was no crowds, you know, cheering you home at the end of the thing. It was you running by yourself and then me for a little bit at the end. So um, do you feel that, challenging yourself in that way has led to make it easy for you to be more disciplined uh, in like business. I was literally listening to Rich Roll and Tim Ferriss this morning talk about it. And Rich Roll is, a, I find a fascinating cat is super structured between six and 12. You cannot distract him. You know, he's training, he's working. And then after 12 o'clock, he puts his phone on. And I was literally reflecting as I was fucking cruising home because I was running late for the podcast. I was like, for me, the structure feels really good. And there's, there's a line in which you become rigid if the whole of your life becomes structured from, you know, hour to hour. For me, and, and you boys obviously see me from a different point of view and you might have a different perspective, it feels good to me at the moment in terms of, good structure, you know, especially from someone who, um, you know, has really struggled with focus in the past, ADHD would, would be uh, motivated to get a lot done, but really wouldn't get much done. You know, like it was just all kind of scattered. So right now in terms of my productivity, my structure, it feels the best it's ever felt. Um, I wouldn't want to get any more structured because then I'd, I'd feel pretty tight and rigid. I think I'm dancing that line. And again, you guys might see it differently, but it feels really good. And I'm even reading a book at the moment um, called Deep Work by Cal Newport around like most of the noise doesn't matter. It's bullshit. And people, and, and I, was, I sent you boys a podcast yesterday, actually a new one by Johan Hari on Focus. So for whatever reason, it's all coming into my sphere at the moment around focus, get rid of the fucking noise, get rid of stuff that doesn't matter. Um, and there's a real, that feels really good to me. So the, the focus the structure, what's that? You mean get rid of the noise? Just like all the bullshit noise, the social media, all the shit that goes on, it's not important. Distraction, distractions. Like the superpower these days is awareness and focus. You know, Johan Hari was talking about something like um, the average kid can focus for 68 seconds. Oh, sorry. The ad, us as an average can focus for 68 seconds. And a kid who's studying for his exams in year 12 or whatever is less than three minutes, something like that. I'm like, how the, and it takes you when you get distracted, even if it's a fucking text message, it takes you 23 minutes to get your mind, energy and emotional body back into what you're doing. No wonder the fucking no one gets anything done these days. So I'm looking at it and going, how can I like dial in and make sure I actually get shit done and actually have an impact on the world as opposed to a lot of people who are like, oh, yeah, I want to have an impact. There's six seconds here, seven seconds there. Mate, you don't want to have an impact. You're happy getting fucking distracted. Yeah. 
funny, mate, I'll, I'll be doing work on my computer, need to access something that's on my phone, go, and then something will get me and I'll be Bang. off. And then I'll put my phone down and then I'll look back at my computer and I'll be like, oh, wait, that's right. That's why I picked up my phone. And then I'll pick my phone back up and then I'll do it. Or then I'll get distracted again and then, and then I'll do it again. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I need to do something on my phone. That's why I keep picking it up and I'll forget. Like it happens so frequently. I get so easily distracted. It's by far one of my biggest areas for growth is like, stop getting distracted. I know you guys call me Retsy or whatever your nickname is for me. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's it's crazy. And even watching that um, Netflix documentary, uh, Social Dilemma, about how the whole, your whole phone is geared to just get your attention. Like, no, come over here. No, come over here. No, come over here. So I know what you mean, mate. That's the, dude, that's the biggest battle. It's us yeah. versus tech. It's, yeah. it's literally us versus tech. Like tech, can you stay focused mm. for two hours and get shit done? Or is tech going to fucking distract you after 16 seconds and you find yourself watching fucking cat videos on YouTube and you're like, I don't know how I got here. Like yeah. that's, for me, that's as big a battle. And there's a real, and deals. I know you'll, you'll resonate with this, you know, in those moments where you are dialed in. There's a real sense of pride um, and accomplishment from me, from someone who used to get distracted by fucking everything. Like if I'm dialed in for two hours and I get a lot of shit done, like I'm walking tall, I'm walking tall because no one fucking distracted me for two hours and I fucking just won. I won the last two hours. So I don't know if you resonate with that, but because, yeah, as someone who literally spent, you know, his whole schooling getting distracted by what seemed to be worse than anyone else, like I'm fucking proud as my, proud of myself if I'm dialed in and getting two hours done undistracted. I remember studying in high school and you'd sit down and sit down and you'd go, all right, I got an assignment. You had the assignment for three weeks and now it's all of a sudden it's due tomorrow. You're like, how did that happen? All right, I haven't started it. Sit down and go do it. I would be 2 a.m. watching YouTube videos and I still <laughs> hadn't started my project and it's due like, you know, third period, like midway through the next day. And I remember calling my mates because again, the importance of who you surround yourself with, right? The mates that I was calling, they were never the mates that were already asleep and had done their assignment the week before. It was the mate that I knew was up watching the YouTube videos and be like, wait, you done that modern history assignment yet? They're like, oh, no, I haven't yet. I'm like, what are you doing? Like watching YouTube videos. I'm like, yeah, same. I'm like, cool. And I feel better about myself. I'm like, sweet. But you never call the mates that are like on, you know, they're like that assignment. Yeah, dude, I did that two weeks ago when we first got it. Like that's been done for ages. You never, you're all, you're trying to surround yourself with people that are going to make you feel good about yourself, especially when you're at that age. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> Um, deals, I'm busting to go to the toilet, but get the, get the ball rolling with the last three months. And what's, uh, what's the theme goal or intention for 2022? Yeah, thanks for, for asking me, B-dubs. I hope you like this answer. I hope you like this answer. Um, you get a big last year, bro. Like last year. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, I got smacked around quite a bit, to be honest. And it was the most solid I'd ever been in shaky in, in, you know, tough waters or murky waters or whatever, whatever the analogy you want to use. Like I was really solid through it all, which I was really proud of myself for because it was one of those like, Oh, okay, cool. The work that I've been doing on myself is actually showing up when I need that to be done. And I was, I put that down to simple, like, a few different things, but simple practices. Like I just, I kept meditating every day. I've been really solid the last, you know, 18 months or so. And especially in Byron, I had a really dialed in routine in the morning, wake up, meditate, journal, go gym, coffee at the Jenny. And I kind of would tick all my boxes that I, that I needed. And so that helped me through it. But I think as a lesson for 2021, and if I had to summarize it in one word would be surrender. Like it was just, a massive lesson in surrender all of last year. I started the year, I was in America. Then I was going to Byron and I only wanted to be in Byron for a month. I ended up staying for five. And then I was with a partner for a while. We broke up and, and then it was very much a case of, oh, I'm like, okay, I'm single. What, what is it for me right now? Okay, it's just time. It's time to be single and I'm going back to LA and live the LA lifestyle of being single. And then 
my partner now kind of popped up out of nowhere and was like, no, nah, that's not your plan, you know? And so then it was this beautiful surrender in this short-term relationship of like a month or so. And we knew it was a month. So we like surrendered and it was beautiful and like, you know, it was amazing. And then I left and then it was surrendering in that. And it was just this constant, 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 like, cool. Can you surrender when you really don't want to? Um, you know, and what that word really meant for me or how I interpret that word being is, is allowing life to happen in a way that you're paying attention to the lessons that it's trying to give you rather than forcing certain things to happen that aren't meant to happen. Um, and that was, you know, yeah, such a massive lesson. It'll be a continual one for me, but throughout 2021, that was just so reoccurring around um, utilizing my own discernment of, of like, follow this path, don't follow that path, follow this path, don't follow that path. And people think surrender is like, you know, probably closely tied to like manifestation and that, you know, that world of like, just surrender and life will happen. It's like, no, you still need to take the actions. You know, I was still, I was surrendered from a broad state of like, okay, I'm surrendering to what happens. But, you know, every day I was yeah, meditating, working out, journaling, still working on my business, still doing things and actioning things, working with Pixie, um, my coach, going and sitting with Ayahuasca and Peyote. Like I was still surrendered on a general state, but day to day I was still taking action to work through the challenges that were, that was coming up. Um, so yeah, that was big for 2021. What about in terms of like yourself? Mm. Through that process, like what was if there were like one or two things that you learned about yourself, you're like, oh shit. Mm. I, I know at one stage you came, you sat down and you're like, blokes, I just realized my ego. I had no fucking idea. Me and Blake sitting going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, the biggest lesson by far, by far was with my ayahuasca experience. And that was something that I'd been aware of for some time, but had no understanding of the power of what that was, which was my own belief around who I was. And for years I'd known, okay, I don't have a great belief. I don't, I don't have this good idea of who I am in terms of I didn't show myself very good self-love through my actions right and and Will Smith talks about it in a little viral video that's really good and it's like if you if you truly love yourself right you're you're doing things to prove that you do right you're staying in alignment with your values you're working out because you love your body you know you're eating well because you love your body you're doing these things that that reflect your own relationship with yourself. And so for me, I'd known, I was like, I'd, I'd, I'd cheated so much in my relationships, but had such a poor understanding of the depths to which that had walked my own idea of who I was in my core. And so once I realized that, and it was through ayahuasca that, man, you're, that the cliche of you can't be with someone who doesn't love themselves, right? I fucking on a core level hated myself, like deep hatred. And I was like, I'm just a shitty, but like, I think I said to you two, when I was kind of at the start of this work or in the middle of the work was like my least favorite compliment to get from anyone was, oh, you're such a good person. Like it would get under my skin. It, I would have like a physiological reaction to getting that compliment of you're a good person. Cause I was like, no, I'm not I'm a fucking horrible person. Like, you don't know me. Like it would just, it was so bad. And so coming to the realization of, of how my actions, my conscious actions of doing things that I knew were bad but going ahead and doing them anyway and turning, you know, turning a blind eye to my own indiscretions. You can't, you can't do that. You can't, like, you know what you do. You know, you can, it, it's, you can say you trained hard, but you know, if you did or not, you can say you're eating well, but you know, if you did or not, you can say that you tried your best, but you know, when you didn't, like you just, you can't lie to yourself. And so 
for me, the good person thing was big. I just, I'd, I would cheat all the time. I would treat my partners really poorly and I would justify and justify and justify. And so seeing it play out in an ayahuasca ceremony and seeing it reflected back in me on, uh, and that's kind of like a whole different discussion in itself that, but just seeing it playing back and going, oh my God, everything is because of this belief. Like so, so much is because of this belief that I am a bad person. And how did I get here? It was consistently compromising on my values, you know, consistently eroding my, my idea of who I was. And so that was huge. That was massive. And that came, you know, just a couple months ago was reconciling my relationship with myself and realizing that I'm a good person that has done bad things healing that and i don't genuinely don't think i could have healed it any other way but through ayahuasca i'm um, healing that and then the next step is like cool we've healed it now let's live in alignment with your values and let's not compromise on them and one of my favorite quotes that i saw last year was um a man needs to have two things a strong moral code of what's right and wrong and the backbone to live in alignment with that. And I've always had a strong moral code, but never the backbone. And so now it's all about the backbone of, okay, I know this is wrong, so I'm not going to do it <laughs> rather than justifying, justifying, justifying. One of the things you said there, which fuck I resonate with so much that it makes me anxious was the bit around knowing, but justifying, which um, the level of, how out of touch people are with their true deep knowing is fucking frightening for Mm. me. Mm. What does that look like now? And, and, you know, you might not always be accountable to your deep knowing that's, that's, you know, a super honorable place to be, which I think very few really are. But what does that look like now in terms of that whisper? Because deep down, we all know. Deep down, yeah. we all know. You know that your relationship sucks. You know that you're full of shit. You know that your relationship's no good. You know that the decision you made around, you know, your health over the last two years is wrong. When you really sit in stillness, silence, solitude, and you surrender, and that voice speaks to you, you can't fucking lie to that voice. The problem with most people is they don't give themselves those moments of stillness, silence, solitude, surrendering to sit with themselves and go, fuck, that's my truth. But it's or, so painful. Yeah. Because mm. they're living a fucking lie, most people. Mm. Or there's too much noise and they keep, you know, they keep the, the noise above uh, above the shoulders and they don't really tap into their body. So what does that look like for you now in terms of it's the subtleness and it's the quiet voice that's always there, but most people are so loud and finding ways to justify the bullshit. But what does that look like? What's that process now for you look like? And how is it different from what it used to be? Probably, I could probably articulate what it used to be better than I can articulate what it is now as I'm still navigating the now, but I spent so much time in the past. And I, I think what I would do was in the past when the whisper would come up, what I've always said is if you are really good at numbing yourself, whether that be through food, alcohol, drugs, sex, porn, technology, if you're really good at numbing yourself, you'll never be faced with the uncomfortableness of the whisper, right? Because as soon as the whisper comes up, you just, you're so good at numbing, you just numb. And I was so good at numbing. Like I was, I had my vices. I had my, my PlayStation that I would love to play, which once I would turn there, everything else would dissipate. I, I was, I, I was really good at numbing through women, through their attention, through like their validation, through sleeping with them, like really good at it. And so I didn't have to spend too much time in the uncomfortable, in the uncomfortable space. But I feel like it's, it's, it will catch up. It will catch up to you no matter what you can't, you can't outrun it. And I think a lot of people have, breakdown to midlife crises, burnout, 
and they look at it as like, oh, I'm burnt out because I'm I'm working too hard and I need to stop working rather than going, I'm burnt out because I'm working too hard and I'm working too hard because I don't want to be at home and I don't want to be at home because I hate my wife and I hate my life. And so that's why I'm working too hard. They just go, oh, I'm working too hard. And then they go back, they rest for a week and then they go back to work and do the exact same thing. And then it, um, two months later, they burn out again. Oh, why am I, oh, I'm working too hard. Okay, and then, but they never fix the underlying thing because they're so good at numbing. And so it'll always catch up to you. It's just, do you have the awareness? Do you have the self-awareness to go, oh, it's caught up with me because of this underlying reason of X, Y, and Z. And so that was me previously. Now I think it's, now what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is just really be open and honest within my relationship I think that's such a catalyst for me right now in all areas is just never lying. When you really think about it, never lying is really difficult because we're always, you know, we have terms for it. Like, oh, it's just a little white lie. You know, oh, it's a half truth. That a white lie is a lie. Half truth is a lie. And so very early on, I was picking up on my language when I was showing up within my relationship of like, that's a half truth. I need to tell the full truth. That's a little white lie. Okay, I need to tell the truth. And that has allowed me to be seen as who I am uh, from a place of no shame. And so I'm able to, within the confines of my relationship, feel love, which also allows me to love myself. And it's kind of the chicken and the egg because it's like, well, I'm loving myself by showing up this way. I'm honoring my authentic self by showing up this way. So it's kind of like what comes first, the love from the relationship or the love from self. I think it's love from self. Um, it just depends how you how you word it or how you look at it. And so for me showing up now, the little whispers come up. It's about just fully owning it because I'm not going to be perfect all the time rather than trying to justify the imperfections and twist it and make excuses. It's just fucking own it. I'm not perfect. I'm not going to shop in my best self all the time, but when I'm on, let's make sure that I'm on or when I'm in my relationship, let's make sure I'm showing up as best I can. And so that's kind of how I'm looking at it now. And again, I'm still exploring the current, current me because I genuinely feel like I'm a complete like there's pre I Dylan and then post I Dylan and post I Dylan is like six months old you know and he's navigating this new he, he, this new relationship with self you know um, and that's yeah will be my to lead into like the next question of what the work is for me over the next 12 months is just honoring that whisper honoring the 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 whisper of like who, who am I, who am I authentically in taking action and being much more similar to you, like much more action-based versus noise-based and just action, 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 action um, is really big for me for this year. Just before Jay jumps in, I just want to touch on lying because I found this a fascinating subject. Lying comes with this really interesting stigma of like you're a bad person if you lie. And there's this... Um, there's this, I guess, continuation of what line looks like. What I would get people to look into and just be open-minded to is what's behind the line. And if you think about it, for a lot of people, it's shame, guilt, fear, dogma. So if, say, for example, you know, I was in the fitness space for 15 years. I reckon every single fucking one of my clients would have lied to me at some stage. They're not a bad person. They've probably just got shame, guilt, judgment around the fact that they couldn't stay on track with their nutrition. They couldn't, you know, turn their alarm off straight away. They couldn't find, you know, the energy to run on weekends when they're out partying. So just be mindful that most of us are carrying around such heavy, and I know you carry a lot of these deals, heavy, deep shame that we're often um, showing up to the world as a lie in some way, or we're covered, you know, we're doing our best to cover our own tracks. So you know, it's easy to get caught on the surface level of like, you know, friction and fuck, you lied to me. But like, what if you came at it from empathy, um, compassion and curiosity? Like what's behind the lie? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I've got a whole bunch of fucking guilt, shame and judgment. And that's why I lied. So 
just being a bit more open-minded as to what is behind the actual mm. line. And I think something that I'm so passionate about because of my own journey is, and I'm, I'm trying to articulate it as well, but it's, I, I, I'm so, it's so important who your role models are. Like it, it, it's just, it, it is so, so important. The role models, your circle, just the things that you're taking in, the information that you take, it's, it, every little bit is so, so, so important. And you really have to be really, really careful about who you're looking up to and who you're trying to emulate because you have no idea what that person is actually feeling. Like you don't know their relationship with themselves. You don't know what keeps them up at night. You, you just, and you can't possibly know, right? You know, I, we've spent two years, the three of us jumping on calls, doing like the foundational work of making sure that we're vulnerable with each other. So we can be, but even still, I have no idea what goes on in your head, Blake. I have no idea what goes on in your head, you know, and we would be the three closest people from a, I know what's going on inside your head point of view because we're always sharing what's going on inside of it. But I still have not, like we still have very limited idea, right? And so I'm super passionate about that because you can see one aspect of someone's life and go, fuck, man, look at that. That's so well and it's amazing. And look at this person. I'm going to be like this person. But you, you don't understand truly what is going on, right? And this is what I would do. I would find examples of men who were being unfaithful to their partners and, but were successful or had money or, you know, had something that I idealized in my mind. I thought, oh, see, like that person's got it going on and they're able to do this. So, I, you know, fuck it, I'll do that. And that's just something that that's just who I am. I remember it, it got so bad that I spoke to one of my best mates on the phone. I'm like, I'm just a bad person. I was on the phone. I'm like, I'm just a bad person and that's okay. I'll, I'm happy to just be a bad person. That's just who I am. And it got that far along that I was openly admitting, well, I'm just a bad person. That's just who I am. And you are always, always, always acting out your own belief of who you are. You're always acting out your belief systems within the world internally. And so it just got so bad. And I would, I, I would justify it because I'd see men and I'd be like, see, I know that guy really well. And he looks happy and he seems happy and, you know, he's got his life together. So that'll be me, you know, and it's just so not the case and going through and again, bringing it back to the ayahuasca journey, like <laughs> seeing that and experiencing the, how I had warped myself. Right. And I remember there's this one <laughs> in the ceremony, I'm like this and I'm like, like all scrunched up in the corner and I'm like, look at myself, like, look at what I'm doing to myself. And it was like a visual, like, like I'm not, you know, this isn't good. This is not good for me to be like this. And so healing that was just, man, like so amazing. Um, to, and again, like before I went into ceremony, I remember sitting with Kat, my partner, and she was having me do this exercise. And she's like, say, say you're a good person. And I would sit there and I'd be like, I'm not a good, I couldn't do it. I was like, I'm a good person. Like it was so hard. Like didn't, it didn't resonate. And then I came out of the ceremony and like two or three days in, we had a similar exercise or a similar conversation. I was just like, yeah, I'm a fucking good person. Like I am a good person. And, and to see that just within a week difference from that one ceremony was like huge because to your point, Blake, once you remove the shame, once you can, uncover why you do these things that you do and you come from a, a healing place an empathetic place of have you know of having self empathy or empathy for self you're able to heal it right but the but then you have to change mm -hmm. and i see in our space and in the spiritual space or whatever you want to call it there's a lot of healing and forgiving yourself and no changing <laughs> and it's difficult to heal and forgive yourself when internally you know you're not going to make any changes, mm. right? And I think the second part's just as important as the first part. Yeah, should we clean it up and let's just like call out like what's our like theme and action the next quarter? So that like let's finish it off. It's like okay, so I'll begin. My theme is around is around wealth and business, and so my action is I'm booking in a session couple of sessions with Pixie, one to do stuff around my human designs around the business side of things, and then one to go next level on 
anything um, blocking with wealth. Also, at the end of every meditation, I'm some, spending some time um, tapping into some different feeling levels around uh, levels of, of, of wealth. And then there'll always, there's going to be, I can see if I have spare time to absorb knowledge that isn't focused on trying to do stuff for the businesses, it's going to be around up-leveling um, wealth. It's going to be a book on wealth, it's going to be a podcast on, on wealth. And, and then tapping into... Um, and even like putting energy into it, like I'm like trying to, like I'm spending um, half an hour a day learning stuff around crypto. That's just an investment and in attention towards a different um, aspect of me building in wealth and also like trying to bring in different levels. So um, for me, that's my like focus. And then they're my like key, key um, actions to, to support that for the next, next quarter. I think this is a good, um, podcast for us to do quarterly as a check-in as well and, and come mm. back to this so for me um double business I, i'm not I, i've done a lot of energy work around it and i've got no doubt that i will excuse me um this year but this first quarter is actually just about executing and big shout out to joe who will actually do a lot of the executing from a business point of view over the next quarter um but from a business point of view it's a yeah, there's a real strong piece for me around um podcast it, it had a really good return for me last year so the execution is very much around getting on as many podcasts as i can from a business point of view so that's business broken down into daily actions and from a connection point of view when it comes to uh, me looking at a theme i tend to break it down into thoughts feelings and behaviors so if i'm looking at connection each morning i'm writing thoughts feelings and behaviors so what are my thoughts so for example someone you know, shoots me a message and I'm deep in work, what's my thought? And then look into that. Feelings, what might I be feeling in my body? You know, there's a big piece for me around energetically feeling blocks around men in the past. And that was something that was broken down in the, the masculine collapse last year. And then um, thoughts, feelings and behaviours. And then behaviours, what am I doing to create connection? So that's how it's broken down um, into a journaling point of view. And then I've got fortnightly um, coaching calls over the next 10 weeks with Pixie as well to work through it on a um, energetic and emotional level. Right. I've got uh, my big focus for this year is doubling, doubling my business as well. And then outside of business is really dialing in and I'll do a bunch of coaching sessions with Pixie, but really dialing in being a man of my word and action over noise um, and then I've got the mask, uh, the mask and the femme collapse coming up. So I've got the femme collapse coming up in a couple of weeks and then I'll do the mask with Pixie too after that. So that's my, uh, my work for the next little while. So it's big, the three of us, it's good. Like I think we take for granted too, the three of us and just how much work we do on, not to fucking wake ourselves up at the end of this podcast, but just shout out to you two boys for consistently doing the work. You know, we kind of started the podcast about talking about how the work never stops, but it is really good to see that when we've got spare coin, it goes towards coaches, you know, very few people, um, especially within this space, continue to up level, continue to do the work because I feel like there's still that stigma of like, well, I'm a coach, so I can't get coaching. Um, and it's great that the, the three of us don't have that ego barrier um anymore to to show up and continue doing the work well i think the big thing for us and i know this has been a real strong theme for Jan janelle and i have last 18 months is that's 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 our normal do you know what i mean mm. like I, I don't and when i say our normal not only us as individuals but our environment especially in byron like that's i i don't i don't think i know any of our crew and jay correct me if i'm wrong I don't know any of our crew that doesn't do the work on some level. So this has just become our reality. Mm. And some people, they'll look at it and go, fuck, I don't know anyone who does the work. But yeah. this is just the environment that we live in. So, um, yeah, you, you, you know, and that's a really important piece for those to think about. If you want to change your world, then it's worth changing your environment because this just is the norm now and we don't, we don't know any differently. So, 
Um, yeah, it'd be cool to check in. You know, obviously our plan is always to execute exactly what we say, which in a perfect world, that's how it would look. But it'll be good for us to check in, you know, at the end of the first quarter and, and see the pros, the cons, what's come up and, and what's worked as a result of the, uh, the attention and theme that we've got. Well said. Thank you, boys. Until next time. Peace. Thanks for tuning in this week. As always, if you enjoyed listening, please leave a review, give us a shout out across socials or share with a friend so that we can continue to share these incredible conversations with more and more people.